So welcome to my channel and today I'm going to be talking about becoming an ODP, which is Operating Department Practitioner. Um, I definitely think if you can get some anatomy and physiology either at A level or just studying before you do the course you will be set up a little bit better to, to start with with some knowledge wise as well. Um, okay so basically what is an ODP? So I know what it is but I'm going to read you the description. For an operating department practitioner they are a type of healthcare provider involved with the overall planning and delivery of perioperative care. So by perioperative care, you're talking about the patient's journey through the whole of their surgery. like that and publications um, it is quite hard so make sure you get it right because it can really drag as I found out can really drag your mark down um, so kind of master that in the first year if you can Um, so you're going to get three folders for your anaesthetic scrub and recovery placements. I would possibly get another folder for things like um, any articles that you're going to use in your essays um, and another folder possibly for um, reflections. You'll be asked to do reflective writing on your time in placements, what was good, what was bad, what went wrong, what you do again differently in the future. Yeah, so reflective writing is something that you're going to be doing a lot of uh, during your time at university. Okay, next thing to have a stationary wise is one of these, one of these small ones or large ones. I probably went through a million of these during my time. Um, okay, so get one of these, they have the lovely sections. And again, I would split it into disciplines, so um, surgery, anaesthetics, recovery. What I did when I first got into anaesthetics was I recorded any information that I needed to know. I would list the drugs that were used in anaesthetics and use the labels and I would write next to them what they were for. So the common drugs for anaesthetics is um, Propofol, everybody will have heard of that from the Michael Jackson uh, story. Um, uh, it's one of the induction agents that we use to put people to sleep and it's a white milky product that's injected. Um, that's probably one of the main anaesthetics and you've got thiopentone. Uh, we use a muscle relaxant to help people uh, 
so that we're able to put them on the ventilator um, and intubate them and control their breathing um, ourselves via the anaesthetic machine and we use uh, muscle relaxants called succimethonium and some other types like rocuronium and vecuronium um, and there's drugs to wake people up um, we use drugs to control their blood pressures like ephedrine um, we use adrenaline, there's just a million different drugs. Then of course you've got your pain medications, things like fentanyl, morphine um, are used intraoperatively to make sure they're not in pain during the operation and get on top of it for when they come round. And you basically have two types of anaesthetics, so you have general anaesthesia and then you have local, sorry, so you basically have three types of anaesthetic. You have local anaesthesia, which could be topical or injected, and that's usually surgery that's done when the patient is awake. So for things like removal of a very simple mole, we'll just inject some lidocaine, and that's a local anaesthetic. Then you have things like spinal anaesthesia. Uh, so a good example of that is having a cesarean. Uh, most ladies are able to have um, be awake for it and have it under spinal. And that is a nerve block, which is at a certain level, so they don't th feel anything uh, from the nipple downwards. And then you have epidurals, which are usually given in labour to control pain, but we use them for other pain to control pain in other surgeries. And then of course you have general anaesthesia, which means the patient is fully asleep. So it's there's a lot of drugs to learn. Don't get scared about that. But use your book, take anything you get given during your days at placement, record it in here, and then basically you can easily flick through. So if the anaesthetist asks you to do something you can look back through your book, find where you recorded it and you'll know what you're doing. Whether it's what equipment you use for certain surgeries, what anaesthetics a certain anaesthetist likes, drug preferences, patient preferences, what instruments a surgeon prefers for certain operations, record it. I still go back to those books now. Studying, I used a lot of these. What have we got here? So these are flashcards, and I used to take them with me on my train in, on the train in the morning and read through them to help me pass my exams. So what have I got here? Spinal trolley. Okay, so on a spinal trolley, what you need to set it up. Probably would have had that written in my book as well. Opsite spray, chlorhexidine liquid, opsite dressing, green syringe, one mil syringe, procedure pack, sprot needle, Whitaker, heavy marcaine, one times 0 0.5 heavy marcaine, diamorphine 250 milligrams, gown and gloves, epidural as above, epidural pack and saline, handy to know, anatomy and physiology questions, ventricular fibrillation, chaotic pattern of electrical activity in the ventricles, electrical stimuli arises from many foci, leading to effective muscular, leading, leads to no, leads to non-effective muscular contraction and no cardiac output that's bad if untreated death is certain due to ventricular standstill gosh that's a bit depressing isn't it uh, name the four h's and the four t's hypoxia hypovolemia hypo and hyperkalemia hypothermia tension pneumothorax tamponade toxins thrombosis <laughs> Name the two shockable rhythms, VF and pulseless VT. So, name two types of beta blocker, so that's a drug. Propanolol, esmolol, atenolol, these are drugs to control blood pressure. Flashcards, the way forward. Diary. Hello Henry, you want to say hello? diary very very important to keep track of everything that you're doing so you will have your blocks in university uh, for teaching and exams uh, it's usually evenly split so usually after a holiday has finished so usually like after the Christmas term you will go and have six weeks or whatever in place in university for teaching and then a, an exam maybe at the end of it when you come back in September after that you'll have a block in university where you'll do practical things like OSCEs and uh, practice maybe uh, assessing the patient popping on they'll, they'll assess you in how you apply uh, monitoring equipment uh, leading to much more intense OSCEs much later on in intubation and assisting the anaesthetist and things like that um, but 
then the rest of the time will generally be in placement working your way through the disciplines of surgery and anaesthetics so a diary is really important to keep up to date with where you're going what you're doing and where your next placement is Generally in placement, I generally worked at Southampton General, I think it was four days a week, so it's very intense, um, and I did 8am till 6pm, so it is like having a full-time job. Back then we didn't have to pay student, uh, we didn't have loans or grants, we had a bursary, which I know you guys don't always get now, um, it wasn't very much, the bursary, I think it was less than two grand every term or every other term I can't really remember I did get my travel paid for eventually so keep all your tickets and send it off it will come back eventually um, but yeah financially it's tough and so you're working three to four days a week eight till six usually full-time hours in the NHS in the operating department uh, in various disciplines and areas um, which doesn't leave a lot of time really for studying, let alone a job. I had a job in a bar in the evenings to, uh, there was no way I would have been able to support myself had I not had a job. Um, so I worked evenings and weekends in a bar. I still to this day do not know how I got through my course. I didn't get a distinction or anything, probably because I, I passed, which in the end was enough for me because I knew the grades did not make me the ODP that I was. Um, I was very good practically at the job, I'm just not a very academic person, I get very stressed during exams, I really really struggled, not afraid to admit that, I struggled. And um, I got through by the skin of my teeth, my lecturers will tell you that, but they were very supportive and if you are struggling please do go and get help and ask for help, they're usually really really good at, at that and ask your cohort, ask your, your team to help you, they, you know, ODP classes at university tend to be quite a small group, you'll all get to know each other, you'll all be supportive of each other, um, make the most of that. Okay, books that really helped me in my first year as an ODP student. Now a lot of the crossover, I found it really hard when I first started looking to find just ODP books, at the time there wasn't a lot out there. Some very experienced ODPs have gone out and um, written some books very recently and uh, at the time there was a handful of ODP from their perspective books out there and I will find them and let you know what they are. I must have given my ODP books to students over the years because I don't seem to have them anymore. Don't lend your books to people, they won't come back. But Generally you cross over into nursing, there is very very little difference, we are registered, a lot of people give ODP a lot of, you know, of a hard time and sort of say, ah it's not the same as nursing, oh they're not as clever as nurses, oh they don't do as much, they're not taught as much, then you know, it's not a registered, it is a registered profession, thank you very much, we do do as much, we have to learn a very hard subject in a short amount of time and what we learn is very technical and um, you have to be able to do it all you have to make remember so much information about so many different operations and anaesthetics and then the recovery process your anatomy knowledge is just as much uh, as if not more intense than nursing you have to know a lot about drug pharmacology and very in-depth anatomy uh, for surgery and anaesthetics so don't let any don't ever let anybody put you down about doing this course you are just as much as a nurse and at the end of it you will have a professional registration with a professional body uh, but yes, so the books will cross over into nursing, so don't let that put you off. This book was a lifesaver for me. So this is the Bellier's Nurses Dictionary for Nurses and Healthcare Workers. Um, oh, Daniela Montgomery, my maiden name. Oh. Um, and it has everything in here in alphabetic order, just like a normal dictionary that you need, but it's very good for quick reference. So if anaesthetist says... Um, our next patient has Turner's syndrome, let me see if I can look it up, and you're thinking what's that, what's that and why is the implications for an anaesthetic, let's have a little look. I know what the implication is, I just want to find the exact ex uh, example for you. So he says, Daniela, our next patient has Turner's syndrome, tell me what the implications for anaesthesia with that condition are, and you go, ah! 
pull out your little book. Yes sir, Turner syndrome. A chromosomal defect in females causing short stature. Classically, an absence of one X chromosome affects one in 3,000 live female births. The majority have streak ovaries leading to absence of puberty and infertility. Other features may include webbing of the neck, uh, nail abnormalities and coarctation of the aorta. Intelligence is usually normal. Okay, so there are a few conditions like Turner syndrome and uh, Down syndrome which can have an effect they need to be thought about when you go into the uh, when you're preparing the anaesthetic room and the airway trolley. It's always best just to inform your anaesthetist of things like this. Uh, they need to know uh, so the size of their neck and the distance here uh, has an impact on what size uh, ET tube, endotracheal tube that you use to intubate the patient when we put them on the ventilator. Uh, these patients with Down syndrome, especially Down syndrome, tend to have a large, larger tongue, which can be a bit of a problem when we're intubating, so the anaesthetist would need to know that. Um, and nail abnormalities when you're doing pulse oximetry, uh, that might cause a problem. If they're saying some of these patients have heart conditions, again, that might be something to look for in their notes when you're prepping them for surgery, and might it's always worth noting anything like that and passing on to your anaesthetist. But so this book was very handy. Got everything from types of bacteria to um, descriptions of disease. Hashimoto's disease. Uh, thyroid disease. Okay. Moving on. Next book that I used in my first year. Day surgery and nursing approach. Day surgery is becoming increasingly common in the UK and throughout the world. A combination of new developments in surgical techniques, changes in hospital resource, allocations and patient demands for quick and more effective treatment have placed day surgery at the forefront of modern patient management. Okay, so day surgery is the thing. Um, most hospitals will push for day surgery if they can. Why? Because it means uh, less expense to the hospital, the patients aren't staying in overnight, it takes the strain off the bed situations, they're not staying in a bed that can be used for an emergency patient and it's better, overall better for the patient to get their operation done and get them home to their own bed, their own food, their own home comforts, with their own family to take care of them as long as they're well enough to be discharged. Um, so day surgery is preferential for, for the the areas that it can be used in and utilised. So a book for this is very, very good. So it explains common day surgery things, common day surgery procedures like cystoscopies, vasectomies, hernia repairs, eye surgery. It explains um, the whole process through. Um, it's quite a quick turnaround day surgery, so it's a really good book from admission through to discharge, telling you exactly what you need. I really use that book a lot. Principles of day surgery nursing, another one. <laughs> oh, I did not use this one a lot. Clinical governance, a guide to implementation for healthcare professionals. I hated this book, I had to read it. You will have an essay on clinical governance. Clinical governance enables healthcare professionals to reduce clinical risks, enhance clinical quality via the application of evidence-based practice. That word you are going to hear so much, you're going to be sick of it. You will hear evidence-based practice in your sleep. Not my favourite subject, but nonetheless, necessary. Buy a book, read it, do the essay. Don't sweat it if you don't get a great mark, as long as you do it and you pass. Oh, the bane of my life. Nursing drug calculations. I'm not very good at maths at all, so I was worried about this, and I did struggle. But it's a formula. Once you get the hang of it, it gets easier. Practice, practice, practice. Start in your first year um, working through books like this on the equations and examples. Um, basically... So you're working out the dosages of oral medications, IV medications. Now, let's talk about drugs while we're on the subject. Student ODPs do not, do not draw up drugs, ever. If somebody asks you to draw up drugs, you say no. 
you are not covered, you are not insured, you're likely to be kicked off your course if they find out that you've done it, that's the line that you're going to get. That is very true. Don't do it. You will be tempted to do it, you will want to do it because you will be doing it once you're qualified. There is no way around that. It is technically the anaesthetist's responsibility, however, with registration for ODPs and things like that and better training, um, once you've done an IV course post qualification you will be drawing up drugs for whether you're in recovery giving patient morphine um, or preparing anaesthetic infusions uh, you will be drawing up drugs and handling drugs the emergency drugs uh, in case of reaction you need to know how to handle them so basically during your training learn the theory learn as much as you can gain as much practice without getting your hands on them yourself and as soon as you're qualified get your IV course done and um, just make everybody aware that you're still learning um, and never if you never ever do anything that you don't feel comfortable with Never ever use drugs that somebody else has drawn up. So if you walk into the anaesthetic room and there's a tray of emergency drugs that are there for an emergency that look like they've been there all night, throw them away. Yes, it is a waste, but it's better than giving somebody the wrong drug that has been either mislabeled. Never ever give a drug that has not been drawn up by yourself or the anaesthetist with you in presence. The anaesthetist usually watches you draw up the drug and that's fine. When we're working on the wards we tend to draw up infusions in a pair of two so that you're checking things. Uh, controlled drugs like morphine is always counted in, counted out, always checked. I'll just say again, the opinions in this video are mine my personally, my experience, that may not be what's happening in your hospital or your placement, it may not be what they're teaching on university courses now, so I apologise if it's not, that is my experience, that you will be asked to draw up drugs, you don't have to do it, it is not necessarily in the job description, um, if you don't feel comfortable, it's the niece's job to do it, make sure you point that out, and definitely do not draw up drugs as a student, it can lead to very serious consequences, don't do it. But start learning your drug calculations um, and practice, practice, practice. And once you've got the formula, you've got it down pat, you will, you'll be fine. Generally, things like uh, anaesthetic drugs, the doses don't change too much. You have your standard female, standard male. It gets really a bit complicated and a bit scary when you start dealing with children and babies. But again, that's paediatrics is a very specialised area. So you'll never just be thrown in the deep end and asked to do something. And if you are make them aware to your student status and say no and that you don't feel comfortable. Okay, moving on, use this book so much. The Re Complete Recovery Room book. So this is for recovery, so when the patient has uh, woken up from the anaesthetic, the operation's finished, they move into the recovery room uh, where the nurses and ODPs uh, recover them, um, give them anti-sickness medication, monitor their blood pressure and heart rate and oxygen, uh, extubate them if necessary, or take their laryngeal mask airway, which is the LMA out, which is for um, spontaneous breathing. Um, they will hold their airway until they're awake enough because most people will still be very sleepy and the airway could be compromised so they will hold their airway by doing by doing a head tilt chin lift as you will all learn by now uh, it's hard to do so you basically hook your fingers under the jaw and force it up it's very hard to do it does cause some pain stimuli so that's likely to wake that's a good gauge of how awake the patient is if they're not responding to you doing this they're still very very sleepy and you must be watching their airway at that point uh, so you'll usually do this they might have some oxygen on their nose or via a mask um, and then you're going to be looking at their muse scores um, are they spiking a temperature? Are they complaining of pain? Have you been giving them pain medication? Everything you need to know until discharge is in recovery and this book is perfect for that. This book is very, very good for writing um, essays regarding uh, recovery. So things to remember for recovery, uh, key points. I guess conditions, re any respiratory or heart conditions are important to take note over. That will be passed over to you in a record when the anaesthetist comes out with the ODP from theatre. They will hand over the patient and say, this is Mr Smith, he has just had a hernia repair uh, under general anaesthetic, so we know what he's had. He's been given this drug, that drug, he's been given a certain amount of morphine so he doesn't need it quite yet, 
and he's recovering quite well. Thank you very much, we take over. He will also mention Mr Smith has known COPD so um, and known atrial fibrillation AF. So that's very important for me as the recovery practitioner to know um, I need to watch their oxygen, I need to be putting extra monitoring on them and we might have some problems with them uh, waking up regarding their oxygen levels. Um, we might want to keep some senior staff or doctors around just in case we run into problems and we need to be very cautious when giving them pain meds when they request it because of their known heart and lung conditions. So recovery is very um, anatomy based. You still need your knowledge of anaesthetics and drugs. You'll you know, need to give pain medication and things like that. A lot of it is observation and a gut feeling with recovery. Um, the worst thing for a patient is to wake up and feel sick after an anaesthetic so we usually give an anti-emetic and anti-sickness medication in the anaesthetic now but quite often we'll need to give some more of that in recovery so it's, uh, it's a really important job and I cherished it very much, I loved that role a lot. Uh, it's a really nice place to be. You'll be checking the wound, that, so they, they will put dressings on the wound in, in the operating theatre. You'll be checking the wound, checking it's not oozing or bleeding or anything like that. They might need more fluids putting through to keep their blood pressure up, so it's quite a busy role and you certainly won't be sitting on your laurels, there'll be lots of things to do while the patient's still asleep. You usually sit at the end of the bed and observe the patient and the monitors. Uh, clinical skills for nurses. Now these come in a range of books, in little flip books and uh, ones like this. This was really important for understanding clinical skills um, and yeah, so very very good at explaining things. Everything from procedure for male catheterisation, so sometimes we have to catheterise patients when they're under for a long time or on the table for a long time to make sure that they're able to pass water. Um, Again, if you're going into the surgical side, once you qualify, if you're going to be a scrub practitioner, you'll probably be the person that's inserting the, the catheter. Again, that's a course that you do post-qualification usually, so don't worry about it, but just a very handy um, book really. So again, learning to take blood, again that is usually done uh, post-qualification, it's a one day course, learning how to pop a cannula in, again post-qualification, very important. Um, how to do blood gases which is looking uh, a special blood test from an artery that measures the uh, very specific levels of oxygen in the patient's blood so we know how well they are doing. This book is so important, the ECG in practice, uh, so used. Basically, so an ECG echocardiogram is how we can see what's going on with the heart in the patient. So it's a tracing of the heart rhythm at that moment in time. Very good at predicting if somebody is having a MI, so a myocardial infarction or heart attack, um, and letting us know if there is any funny rhythms going on like atrial fibrillation and other things. Um, so heart rhythms can be influenced by lots of things, uh, drugs, especially anaesthetic drugs. Um, blood pressure tablets, stress, um, levels. So one of the things that you keep an eye on is things like their salts, their magnesium and calcium levels. Drugs like digoxin, beta blockers, they can all have effect on ECGs. Um, there is a basic waveform and then a million different types of rhythm that come after that. Um, this will help you interpret them. It's not anything to get hung up about, but I would. it's in the exam, so start learning them as soon as possible. When you do an ECG on a patient, ask if you can have a look at it, get the anaesthetist to break it down and explain to you what's going on. Learn what a normal ECG looks like, and then you will know when something doesn't look normal. You don't necessarily have to know what's wrong. There is always people around you who will take it to the anaesthetist and say, I'm not sure about this, could you take a look? You don't necessarily need to be able to diagnose, but you need to know what's normal and what isn't and flag it up. Okay, this book, probably the most used, probably a much more up-to-date version, Drugs and Pharmacology for Nurses, saved my life so many times. It's a really good book, it's not reams and reams of information, it just gives you the important stuff um, and is very easy to understand I think. Let's pick a drug. Antiemetics, basically. 
drugs to stop sickness. So ones used in perioperative environment, we've got cyclozine, give that quite often in recovery. Be aware it can cause a tachycardia, which is a fast heart rate. So if you have a patient with a heart condition, you might want to look at that. Um, Ondansetron is usually used in cancer treatment, but we use it in the anaesthetic process. It's a very good antiemetic, quite expensive, so there's a bit of an issue with when you use it and when you don't. Um, metoclopramide, domperidone, they're all antiemetics. Uh, really, really good for really, really good book, especially for learning about antibiotics. Uh, so quite often we give an antibiotic during the surgical procedure, especially for things like orthopedic surgeries. Uh, they usually have an uh, a, a drip of antibiotics that run through during the operation so we get on top of the anti antibiotic side of things to make sure there's no infections getting into that very precious operation site. Uh, there are certain specialities in surgery that are more prone to infection and it can be more devastating. Orthopaedics is one of them and urology so you'll be uh, need to learn a lot about antibiotics so get this. Always follow NICE guidelines, so they're updated very, very frequently, so always go online and just sort of check. The BNF is a book uh, which contains all medications. Um, that's now online, so if you can get the app. The difference between me training and you training is that you're going to be able to get so many medical apps. There's, um, I mean, I wouldn't trust things like ECG apps, uh, but they can be quite handy. There's NHS apps. Um, you can quickly Google what the name of a drug is. I think apps are quite positive, but the BNF one, if you can get the app on your phone, really, really handy as a student. Okay, there's a million different books that you'll use as an ODP student and will need to reference, but this is the ones that I use, and it was Anesthesia and Intensive Care, an Encyclopedia of Principles and Practice. It tells you everything you need to know about the very extensive subject of anaesthetics. So, um, the other book I would recommend in first year is some human physiology books. Um, the crash course ones are really good. I would really recommend the Ross and Wilson anatomy and physiology book. Um, and let me just see if I can find you the ODP book that I recommend. Okay, you've got Foundations of Operating Department Practice. Complete OSCE skills, that's a really good one. Okay, this is the book that I lived by when I was doing uh, my course. And this is Core Topics. Core Topics in Operating Department Practice, Leadership and Management, and that is by Brian Smith, Paul Rawling, Paul Wicker, and Chris Jones. And especially Paul Wicker, uh, he's a very, very experienced, well-known ODP. Um, one of the first people to kind of write books on the subject for students in training. It's core topics in operating department practice um, and issues encountered by healthcare staff working in the operating department. Topics covered include corporate governance, oh actually I don't think this is the right book, sorry. No, sorry, that's leadership and management. Okay, so you want core topics in an core topics in operating department practice by Paul Wicker. That's an amazing book. Any books that are on the perioperative uh, journey or pathway. <sighs> There's so many that you can get. I recommend getting a lot of them from the library. There's journals that you can sign up to. The perioperative journal is a really good one. The HCPC have one. Technic, I believe it was called. Um, you can sign up to the College of Operating Department Practitioners. They offer some really good online CPD, which is Continued Professional Development, which you will need to continue to do. So basically, once you qualify, you need to demonstrate each year after you qualify that you're continuing learning, you're continuing courses. So you'll need to do refreshes. A lot of them are done day to day within the hospital um, and you get a certificate to put in your folder. But a lot of them is really good to, to do yourself and continue your practice, really. I mean, once there's so many avenues for jobs outside of just being an ODP. So if you're into surgery, you can become a first assistant. There is a role that is being developed to, it's an intermediary role, um, I believe it's called non-medical anaesthetist. Um, these are all things you would have to go back to, to uni for. Um, 
I started off as an ODP, so I started off, I chose, so usually when you qualify you choose two disciplines to practice day to day. I chose anaesthetics and recovery, they tend to go really hand in hand, um, or people tend to just be a scrub practitioner. Um, so I rotated between cardiac anaesthetics and um, general recovery, and I loved it, absolutely loved it. Cardiac anaesthetics was a dream to, to work in, everything from bypass to perfusion, it was just fascinating. Um, so cabbage surgeries, coronary artery bypass grafts, I lived for it. Um, I have a heart condition myself and a number of other medical conditions which have meant that over the years I've really struggled to do the very very long days, be under no illusion that the days will be long. A long day shift is usually like 7 till 7 and possibly a bit longer. Um, in theatres, hours day shifts tend to be 8 till 6, um, there is always a late shift, um, sometimes you get an early which is really nice till 2 o'clock, or you have the night shift, the dreaded night shift. Um, you won't do any of these until you're qualified, so don't worry. Uh, but after a lot of years doing it now, um, 15 years in total in the NHS, I am now completely finished with the NHS for a little while at least. Um, um, going to be looking for a new career not because I didn't love the job I absolutely love the job if I could have continued to do it um, with my health I would have but there is a limit to some things so that's it for me for the NHS for a little while and I'm heartbroken to have to say that because I fought really hard to graduate and I loved every single second of becoming an ODP um, it's been a blast from start to finish but I found other ways to transition so in the past it wouldn't have been possible but just recently um, in the last five years I've worked in several different roles I worked as a medical assistant which was popping in cannulas and um, taking bloods and doing ECGs and nasogastric tubes and catheters, so a very hands-on role in AMU and A&E. So when you qualify you're a band 5, which is the same as a staff nurse, um, so that role was actually below that, it was a 3-4, uh, but I didn't mind because I was gaining experience in, all, in doing all of those sort of physiological things. Um, next I moved back up to a band 6 to do a private hospital and that was anaesthetics and scrub. Then I moved on again to a, a higher 6, band 6 role, uh, working in Bournemouth as an anticoagulation practitioner. So that was, our, my husband had a DVT and I was so thankful to the nurses that saved his life with his anticoagulation, a deep vein thrombosis, that I wanted to learn more about it and that led to me transitioning. Um, and because a lot of... Um, um, roles are open to NMC pins, so nursing and midwifery pins and HCPC pins now. Um, just keep looking, there's lots of different roles out there, as long as it falls within your, you work within your job uh, specification and your work within your role, you'll be fine uh, and sort of stay within your confines of your practice you'll be fine. So my next role was as an anticoagulation practitioner, loved that, learned all about warfarin and clexane and um, apixaban, um, all sorts, uh, absolutely loved it. Because again, that's a very important topic if you're doing your ODP course, learn all about venothromboprophylaxis. Anticoagulation is a huge part of the perioperative journey, so the patients will be given socks called TED socks to wear, they might have Floatron boots in the operating theatre, or they might be given um, pharmaceutical prophylaxis like Clexane, which is a little jab in the tummy, which is a heparin to keep their blood thin. The socks force blood up and down the leg as if you're walking, the Floatron boots push, uh, make with pressure, uh, push the blood flow up and down the leg to make sure that they are at the least risk of getting a deep vein thrombosis. You get a deep vein thrombosis when you are static, so there's a triad, uh, Virchow's triad I believe, and it's all about stasis and hypercoagulability, basically when your blood is not moving and you're not moving around, that's when you run the risk of getting a clot. Um, so again, Make sure you learn about your hospital's policy on that. Uh, make sure you learn all about the uh, emergency treatment for uh, a VTE event. Uh, make sure you know what to do if a patient says they've had a VTE, whether it's a pulmonary embolism PE or DVT in the past. Uh, it all has a big impact and you will do 
something on it in exams or assignments so make sure you learn about it preventing those um, events from happening is very very important Okay, so um, after that I moved on to a different role in pre-assessment, which is my last role, um, which is assessing the patient. So they've been asked to, they've seen a surgeon, they found that they've got a hernia in their tummy and they've recommended that they have surgery for it. Then then come and see us for a pre-assessment. Um, I will do blood tests, I'll have a chat with them, I'll take their medical history, I'll do a physical examination on them. So I've had to do a different, you know, you do so you do different courses on learning how to take history and how to do physical examination you listen to their heart sounds you can order lots of different tests maybe a chest x-ray if they've got any sort of um, rheumatism we'll want to have a spinal x-ray uh, c-spine x-ray before we move their head on the operating table to make sure that uh, everything's hunky-dory um, so it's basically we want to know if they're anemic um, we might need to give them pre-op uh, iron infusions they might need to have for the type of operation, if it's major, major surgery, we might need to order pre-order blood for the operating theatre, a couple of units. Uh, so basically, it is preempting anything that might go wrong in the surgery and fixing it beforehand, um, assessing their general fitness and health and well-being for the surgery. Um, are they a suitable candidate for day surgery, or do they need to become an inpatient? Do we need to book them a bed? Um, I've really enjoyed that role because not only did it. Uh, did I not get to not only did I get to utilize my experience in anesthetics um, it was very hands-on patient based I really really enjoyed that um, being an ODP can be quite te technically focused a lot of people find when they're doing anesthetics and scrub that because the patient's either asleep um, they, they don't get as much hands-on uh, patient time that you sometimes get when you're nursing I was worried that I'd chosen the wrong course between ODP and nursing um, because of that when I first started. But you get that very much when you do recovery and like I just said there's other roles that you can do so don't be put off by that. It's a very technical job but there's still a human element to it as well. Okay so this is my folder. So I was RODP8, Daniela Montgomery. Um, this is just, this is what you will be asked to compile by the end of your course before and then you submit your registration so hopefully you've passed all your exams and everything else um, and then you submit your registration to the HCPC for professional registration and after that you can work uh, so basically this is a record of anything and everything that I've done uh, role profiles current profile current role profile I'm a second year student studying at University of Portsmouth and I'm currently experiencing clinical placement at Princess Anne Hospital and Southampton General I've been in practice since October 2009 and have gained new skills and knowledge in perioperative care uh, within a variety of settings including scrub and anaesthetics. This term I have been learning a great deal about the specialities of obstetrics and gynaecology and anatomy and physiology. Okay, so the placements that I undertook, my very first placement was in general theatres. Um, so lots of general surgery, tonsillectomies, ENT, um, general abdominal surgery, uh, CPOD which is the emergency surgery, um, I did orthopaedics, so anything to do with bones, I did a placement in, op, op, in eyes, uh, didn't enjoy that one too much, <laughs> um, obs and gyne, so um, cesarean sections and things like that also very major uh, gyne not all major but gyne surgery hysterectomies sterilizations things like that um i did placement in cardiology pre-assessment oh so many different places intensive care um colorectal <laughs> All of this you have to learn. Um, and I, basically, every time you do a procedure, you keep a record of that procedure. So, so every time that I witnessed a procedure, I would log it and my teacher of the day would sign it off, my mentor. Uh, every time I then was able to scrub in for a procedure or uh, assist in a procedure, I would have outcomes 
that I would need to have checked off, uh, so competencies as we call them. So when you're able to fully assist a surgeon with um, in the operation by handing the instruments and, and things like that, you'll be signed off for. So all of that is logged. So I guess what I'm saying is admin is a really big thing. Keep everything neat and tidy, keep a record of everything. I found here. Books from Blackwell, how to write essays, grammar book, taking notes from lectures, reading for study. Bane of my life during my course, Harvard APA referencing. If you know, you know. Yeah, so Harvard APA is how you reference your um, your books and um, create a bibliography at the end of an essay and things like that. And, publications um, it is quite hard so make sure you get it right because it can really drag as I found out can really drag your mark down um, so kind of master that in the first year if you can right I don't know that there's anything else more that I can really say to you um, university as a mature student um, probably not that much different to, to being a regular student nobody had an issue with my age um, we had a lot of fun we went out quite a bit um, it's definitely not like doing a regular degree, like an English degree. Um, the Everything has to be packed in so tightly, you, you can't really miss anything. Um, lectures are very long, very intense. On the plus side, a lot of the course is practical, so working on the dummy, this um, a lot of universities, mine especially at Portsmouth, had a simulation uh, suite where they could program in the dummy was having particular problems and you talk to it and it's basically like you and a patient and that's how they obsess you for OSCEs um, and it's a compu it's all computer based so the patient's uh, vital signs would be up on the monitor and they would throw in a certain scenario that was going to happen to it the patient was going to develop anaphylaxis to the anaesthetic or something and then you react and that's how they assess you it's quite daunting OSCEs but just practice 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 try not to to get too nervous um, the day-to-day -day important thing is how you are in placement. Be professional, be punctual, be on time, try not to miss any days, um, be polite and um, ask questions, look interested, um, take every day as an opportunity because you might not get to go back. If you get the chance to work with somebody that really explains something well, ask if they can possibly be your mentor, uh, form a good bond with people because ultimately these are the people that you're going to be working with once you qualify so don't burn any bridges. Um, take advantage of the teachers at the university. If you're struggling let them know in advance. It's really difficult. I found it really hard to um, work-life balance because I was working in the bar after work, getting in at 4am, especially at weekends. When I probably should have been studying at the weekends, I wasn't able to. Um, so I didn't do as much study as I should have done. Um, uh, and it reflected on my grade. I wish I could have done better. Um, however, that doesn't mean that it, it didn't affect my the way I could do my job. I was a very good ODP. Um, it's a very practical job, so if you're not necessarily the most academic, it's a really good job to do. Great job satisfaction. I can't tell you how much I loved the role at all, really. It was just amazing from start to finish. Loved uni, loved the teaching, loved the lectures, loved being a student. The only thing I would say is it's not like an English degree. Um, I didn't get to, to do much of the freshers thing. I didn't get to do um, join any of the societies or clubs because... I was at the hospital till six o'clock at night and then I don't drive so I had to get the train home. By the time I got in it was eight o'clock at night, I had to do a bit of studying, then it's all repeated the next day and I, then I was working at the weekend. Study when you can, if you're traveling, study on the train. Uh, I used to pop post-it notes up on my cupboards in my house for blood gas uh, results or um, ECGs, drug names, operation types, anything. I used to put those up so whenever I saw it, it would go in. Flashcards are amazing. Um, just use any resource that you can. There's so much on YouTube now compared to when I was studying. Um, and I guess, I think maybe I might do a, a couple more videos depending how this one goes down. Um, it's been a while, obviously, since I was a student, but if there's anything you guys would like me to talk about or explain, I'll do my best. Um, mostly I just wanted to jump on, and obviously, most of my videos are about makeup and my little life and things like that. 
um, and my career that I'm hoping to do in the near future is going to be very very different and a, a real uh, step away from the medical field and the NHS um, but I will always be an ODP at heart and uh, very proud to be actually I'm a very proud anaesthetic practitioner I've enjoyed every moment of my 15 years in the NHS and I've very much enjoyed my time at university I hope you guys enjoy your course I hope you have a wonderful time and you love the job as much as I do um, if you're going to Portsmouth have a great time if you're going elsewhere have an absolute blast uh, make lots of friends some of the friends that I made friends with on my course are still friends now um, it's a wonderful time it's a wonderful discipline to learn and it's very very rewarding career and job and uh, you can go places with it so enjoy good luck and cheers to the class of 2022 uh, the future ODPs registered ODPs um, good luck and if you like the video give it a thumbs up and uh, subscribe if you want to see some more um, thanks for watching guys and I'll see you soon and if you want to follow me on Instagram it's Daniela underscore Logan underscore makeup take care that's it from me bye